if you get all uptight about it, if, invariably what's going to happen is that you're going to get choked out. The guy's going to get your arm. Something bad is going to fucking happen to you. Or girl. It could be a girl even. You know, I'm not not sexist at all on that. I'm sure having watched some uh, MMA fights over this weekend, I am absolutely certain there are women out there that can kick the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I have no doubt of it. It's all what's between your ears and in your heart, of course. What kind of uh, attentiveness you've put to your training, you know? And uh, yeah, I had I had um I had a really good class. Um, my my first uh, my first match. I think I was a little better paired um, with with my opponent. He was a blue belt too, so I mean, there's there's that. Um, but aside from that, I I felt like he was he was a really good test for for me. And I mean, he he almost had me a couple of times. And uh, it's funny every time I would get out of something, he's like, "Oh fuck, that was good." <laughs> and so it's like he's very very encouraging the whole time, and I I, I really like that. And um, you know, I, I try to be encouraging as well. You know, if somebody, you know, get gets me in something, I, I give them a compliment, man. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, it was uh, it was interesting. I I didn't actually get the choke that I was trying to get, and I should have gone about it a little bit differently. I think that if I had uh, if I had tried to set it up a little a little easier, you know, like maybe stayed up on his shoulder with my hand until I actually had. Um, one end of the zipper, you know, and then, you know, snuck it up around his neck or something like that, but anyway, uh, yeah, like I said, it, it was, uh, I, I didn't get the choke, I, I didn't actually tap him any, any time today, he was very, very good, um, but, uh, it was, a like I said, it was a very good test, because he's, he was a little bit taller than me, but he's built a lot like I am, so, it, it was, um, it was like I said, it was, a, it was a good test for where I'm at, you know. But I, I think I should have tried a little bit harder to take him down because I, I felt like there were a couple of opportunities that if I, you know, just like straightened out his elbow and and, and reached down and grabbed, you know, or reached down under his armpit and I could have like thrown him over my shoulder or some shit like that. But, uh, yeah, I felt like during the uh, stand-up portion, I, I, I don't work my stand-up and takedowns enough. And I, I feel like that's a really lacking part of my game. And I, it's very unfortunate because, you know, the, the fight does go to the ground 90% of the time. But there's always the period before you go to the ground that you got to consider. And I, I've been getting kind of crafty with the with the ways that I, I go about getting to the ground um, but one thing I've been trying to do right off the bat is, um, and, and this one is tough for me because I, I'm an engagement guy. I like to close the gap. I like to stay on you like white on rice, you know, scrunch you up, you know, get get an underhook and, and then grab the back of your other shoulder, you know, just ma- make make life tough on you, man. I'm 200 and something pounds. That's, that's what I'm going to, that's, that's how I play. Yeah, anyway, um... <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that, um, but yeah, the uh, the gentleman that I that I rolled with it was funny. I found I think it was Katie's hair. Uh, this girl that's uh, I think she's a yeah she's a purple belt, um, but she was rolling in the same vicinity with with her boyfriend uh, before me and my partner had gotten there. So she and she has long hair. And there was this big old ball of long hair, and I thought it might have come off of my head, but I didn't. I didn't remember, you know, any kind of tugging or anything like that. And plus, her her hair is a little bit longer than mine, and it was definitely hair that was was longer than mine. But I, uh, yeah, I, I kind of freaked out though, because it was like it was on my shoulder, and and I like I picked it off my shoulder, and I'm like, dude, did I lose this big ass chunk of hair off my head? <laughs> you know, but uh, no, it was not my it was not my hair. Um, anywho, enough of jujitsu. Like I said, it was it was a good class. The the next guy that I rolled with though, um, he he was much bigger than me. 
as far as my, my weight goes. I think he's in the 230, 240 class. Just maintained a really, really dominant play on me. And uh, I, I was defensive the whole time. And I I think if I had a little more energy left over, I probably would have thought to do some other things. Um, and the uh, I I needed a, like another minute. If I had another minute, I could I, I could have tired him out enough to uh, get some pressure on him. But uh, m- like I said, mostly I was defensive, you know. And uh, I I let him go probably like sixty percent into a movement before I would negate him, just because I I was really tired and he was really putting his weight up on me, you know. And so my biggest I, I think it's it was really good for me because. It, it caused me to really evaluate my situation. It's like, oh shit! First, I'm flat on my back. I got to get up on my side. I can't do this. You know, big whoop de doo. He's he's working towards my back. No no panic. You know, I I know where his where his right knee is, and he doesn't have a hook in, and so you know everything is cool. And uh, I did do some really interesting things um, with shifting my hips like to uh, to get out of stuff and like he he did make a play for my back and like I said it, it was just really exp- an, a really expensive waste of time for him you know and that's that's my defense pretty much is like there's always one or two little chinks in the armor you know it's like if you can if you can close off the ground with your hip and they can't get a, get around get a uh, hook around you that's that's a big chink you know and then after that if you can like if you can take your your left heel like see you're, you're on your right side right if you can take your left heel and and put it up behind your your right knee in, in between like you and him you know to separate you and him and then shift the the leg out you know like lift lift the hip up and out and you can kind of kind of shrimp on the inside of him you know it was, it was interesting i actually did that today it was it was pretty cool it was unorthodox as all hell, but I got to it, and and so I I managed to get to where I was facing him, and uh, switched it around to a um, a side control. But I I think he like he swept me really quick or something like that. That I it did not last long. <laughs> He's very very good. He's a very technical gentleman. But uh, yeah, like I said, I was defensive the whole time. I think it. I think if I'd had ninety more seconds. I think I, I could have changed the table like one more time and, and stayed dominant at least until the, the time was up, if not possibly gotten in a submission attempt of my own. Because he, he was running he was running low on gas and I was actually working towards something and I think if like I said, if I had another ninety seconds I would have been able to change it to a dominant position. Gotta get to position before submission. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. I got a ton of articles. I don't know exactly where we're going to go. We're just going to fly by the seat of our pants like we normally do. Because I, I always get the best results by doing that, man. I come I come to this like absolutely nothing. I'll start into an article. Next thing I know, we run into some legislation that concerns cryptocurrencies. And so I like to I like to cover that kind of shit. Or white paper or you know something, or some, something that I feel like should be shared anyway let's go ahead and throw down into some music and it's finally shown up in here that i've got between the buried in me at least um automata one um it's not showing me automata two well there's one song in here from there um i don't know if i want to start off with that though i'm not familiar enough with the the work i mean this one looks long enough but i don't even have a title for it for some stupid reason, between the buried and me, they don't have any metadata on their shit. Like the they're, they're like not cataloged or something like that. I mean, maybe they're like independently printed up or something. That's that's a possibility. But they're very very good. So wherever they're being produced, I don't I don't really give a fuck. Um, let's go ahead and throw down a little bit of body count. I like opening up with them. Talk shit, get shot, first dance. Here on Coin Metal. Talk shit. 
And that was Megadeth with Polaris. It's still going, and there's still more to that song, but we'd, we'd kind of run a little overlong in music. I didn't even put a tag up for it, actually. But, you know, we had to, we had to do what we had to do, you know, get a kind of a smoke break and all that in. But I did actually come across something that kind of tickled my fancy. As you all know, I love legislation, and uh, I, I, I I like disseminating it here on this show. <laughs> and we may actually re- be reading some tonight. Uh, this one is on uh, CoinIdol.com. Romania targets cryptos with new electronic money law, a draft bill published. Hmm. Okay, so think about that one for a moment, just a moment. A draft bill published, not presented, not voted on, just a draft bill published. Um, I'd like to save you all some trouble right now. It's not going to be effective, and before you know it, you're going to be putting the the guy next to you in jail for it. (sighs) If it even gets that far. Anyway, uh, so let's check something really quick. This is supposedly Coin Idol's own stuff, and let's verify something here. Uh, 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 Coin Idol. It looks like Coin Idol is a guy, so. Yes. Yes, penis. Continuing on. Missing in... Oh, sorry. Romania has become the most recent nation to institute a regulatory process explicitly aimed at digital currencies and cryptocurrencies. The Romanian Minister of Finance officially published a draft draft of an emergency ordinance that clearly outlines the conditions and full requirements to be fulfilled as an issuer of electronic money in the country. The issuer of the electronic money must have a minimum of 350,000 euros worth of share capital according to the draft bill and each individual member must be vetted and officially approved by the National Bank of Romania. I can see how good this one's going to go already. Um, Seemingly to deal with organized crime. The fourth, the fourth put vet, vetting measures will have full verification of individual mer- member personal legal records and tax payment history. It's not going to happen. Missing in action. The draft didn't mention the term cryptocurrencies anywhere. It only used electronic money and it also noted that electronic money issuance may only be done by electronic, uh, electronic money institutions local or regional public authorities, credit institutions, and the European Central Bank. It is clearly stated that in order to be considered as an electronic money institution, organizations have to be officially authorized to do so as the Romanian law states, i.e. for crypto firms to operate legally in the country, they must fully register under and be watched by the BNR, which also gives the regulatory authorization to issue out electronic money. Oh my goodness. I just had like a a mild epiphany. (laughs) Continuing on. The draft further indicates that authorizations for electronic money issuance are only valid for one year immediately from the date of issue In the event that the firm doesn't begin operations in that period, the authorization will automatically be voided. In what may appear to be a threatening clause targeting cryptos, it also indicates that authorization will be withdrawn in the case of money issuance in the case the money issuance activity doesn't happen in the country or if authorization was provided based on wrong information. Adding weight on structure. 
The draft goes ahead to indicate that the BNR will only give electronic money licenses after being convinced of the provider's capability to display a distinct organizational structure, solid accounting and administrative practices, corporate governance, and effective risk management policies. In case the firm wishes to have the approval to issue electronic money, there is a guaranteed three-month waiting period for responsible authorities to make checks and due diligence. This means that the regulatory desires to, to surmise full control over money issuance operations in Romania. The BNR will effectively gain sole ownership of the overall electronic money sector if the emergency ordinance bill scales through. Um, <clears throat> it's very ambitious. And I keep getting this, uh, this silly impression from people that they think this shit isn't global anymore. And uh, I, uh, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. And uh, it seems like there's these people that believe that if they have their own little cryptocurrencies or digital currencies in their enclaves, that they're going to be able to restrict the economic growth and development of their area via that those vehicles, whatever whatever currency or currencies they may be. And that day is over. Uh, that that hasn't been true in the on, on this planet for shit at least 2010, if not a little bit earlier than that 2009. Um, <clears throat> but I mean reliably so. If you count 2010 as the starting point until now, you give me a fucking break. There's there's nothing that's on the table right now that is going to stop you from being able to use a cryptocurrency that they don't have any control over. And it was funny, it was like this, uh, I can't remember the, the exact context of it, it was some experimental enclave, and they were going to have their own digital currency that they were going to use in-house. And I tried pointing, to, pointing out that it's not going to stop people from using other currencies. It's not going to stop people from, from trading in other currencies. And there was somebody arguing with me about it, thinking, you know, oh, they're only going to issue blah, blah, blah. It, it doesn't matter what they issue. If the people that live there have access to the outside world via the internet, forget about it. Your, your economy is, is not going to be closed anymore. There are going to be people trading your currency globally, whether you want them to or not. They'll find a way to do it. <laughs> if, they can, if they can do it digitally within the enclave, they will find a way to do it digitally outside of the enclave. That's just, that's the way this shit goes. <clears throat> Let me uh, look at this Romania thing. Uh, where is it here? Draft bill, blah, 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 blah. And get out of that crap. Yeah, 35. That 350,000 uh, euro thing. <sighs> that, that That's just so fucking hilarious. It's like, ho hold enough money for us to, for, for it to be worth it for us to try and bust you and steal your money. And, uh, you know, then then try and go forward from there, and, and and hope like hell you don't run across one of our one of our little bills or modifications of a existing bill that we do behind your back, and just not bother to let you know about it. But all all of our friends at the banks have been previously notified, and so everything's cool for them. I'm trying to find the uh, draft bill for this business. See if we can actually digest the bill itself, <clears throat> which I would imagine we probably can. It's just, if it's like twenty pages or something like that, it should not be very difficult. Use Bitcoin, Coin Telegraph, blah 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 blah. blah. Authority pills are done. 
the blog post, Coindesk, BTCM. Let's try Coindesk. Maybe we'll find an actual link to the uh, the article or legislation in question. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it just it goes about uh, digital monies and not specifically cryptocurrencies. So let's see here, business review. Yeah, see, I keep getting back to this stupid fucking article that doesn't have any links to this this electronic monies bill. Electronic money. Uh, draft. See, I'm trying to find the legislation because I, I I really like to read it. I like to uh, I like to digest this stuff because. You know, it it helps to understand where their mind is on it. You know, it's like... But from what I can tell... Let's see here. Fast electronic money order here. Additional services, electronic posting. No, wrong thing. Uh, No electronic thing. Uh, Local report trying to find a link I'm not seeing one so far it's kind of it's kind of lame I was hoping I get a fucking article out of this or I mean an episode out of this thing cause it damn it this fucking article well whatever we'll read it because we can't find anything else on this thing and this is on uh, businessreview.eu Romanian authorities prepare draft bill regulating electronic money. And this is by Georgetta uh, uh, George. Uh, okay. I'm assuming no penis. Uh, this is authored 5 7 2018. Uh, it's kind of old. Uh, the Romanian Ministry of Finance has published a draft emergency ordinance regulating the activity of issuing electronic money or e-currency. The draft sets an EU, or, uh, I'm sorry, a year, a 350,000 euro threshold for the issuer's social capital, and demands that all members of the issuer be cleared by Romania's central bank. Hmm. Yeah. That's- I'm not going to read this fucking thing. Basically, they're saying that you know they're going to determine who gets to create digital money, but they're they're probably talking about within their already regulated markets, and not specifically with regard to cryptocurrencies. However, with regard to exchanges, I was thinking about it. That little epiphany there. Um, what if? an exchange were to be issuing currencies based on the volumes of of cryptocurrencies that they have you know say they've got confirmed reserves of you know 200,000 bitcoin right and so then they're using that as a uh, as collateral despite the fact it's your money um, <laughs> using it as collateral for uh, for creating tokens I don't know. It's something to consider because I mean, like, why why would they be looking to uh, to make that kind of limitation? You know, I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> Let's see here. I do have some other stuff that I wanted to get into, though. And you know, I, I think this was this one was probably good enough. Because I, I I do I do like I do like economics. This is on uh, Bloomberg Opinion or Bloomberg.com in the opinion section. Economics. 
what economists still don't get about the 2008 crisis. The general public might understand what causes busts better than the wonks. I don't know shit, because we actually have to live in the physical world that their bullshit creates. And uh, this is by Noah Smith, author July 29th, 2018, at 4 p.m. PDT. Macroeconomists tend to advance, or at least to change, one crisis at a time. Mac- macroeconomics. The Great, Depre- uh, the Great Depression discredited the idea that economies were basically self-correcting and the following decades saw the development of Keynesian theory and the use of fiscal sim- stimulus. The stagflation of the 1970s led to the development of real business cycle models which saw recessions as the efficient working of the economy and the central, central bank meddling meddling as likely only to cause inflation. The painful recessions of the, of the early 1980s saw a shift to so-called New Keynesian models in which monetary policy is the central stabilizing force in the economy. The housing bubble that peaked in 2006, the financial crisis of 2008, and the Great Recession that followed can constitute another crisis. So far, however, it has produced mostly evolution rather than revolution in economists' conception of the business cycle. The bubbling, the bubble, and the following crisis convinced macroeconomists that recessions often emanate from the financial sector, an idea that had often been resisted or overlooked before, except by Ron Paul, P- Peter Schiff, a whole, whole bunch of other people. There was immediately a flurry of activity as economists hastened to shoehorn finance into their standard models. Some now believe that the addition of finance will allow new Keynesian models to forecast crises before they happen. Others are understandably skeptical. <laughs> Me too. Another important insight from the Great Recession was that traditional monetary policy isn't always enough to stabilize the economy. When interest rates hit zero, other measures are needed. These could include quantitative easing, forward guidance, or fiscal stimulus. As New Keynesian pioneer Jordy Golly noted in a recent summary, there has been much work figuring out how New Keynesian models can deal with zero interest rates. There has also been much work on making the models more realistic by taking into account the big differences between consumers and companies. There are important innovations, and they address glaring deficiencies in the pre-2008 models, but they don't feel like a big break with the status quo. Most importantly, the basic notion of recessions is driven by rational actors' responses to unpredictable sudden events or shocks, as economists call them, remains in place. That would come as a jarring surprise to many outside of academia. I'm sorry, to many outside academia. To lots of people, it seems obvious that the 2008 crisis was long in the making, the product of years of financial and regulatory folly. In general, the notion that economic booms cause busts instead of being random, unrelated events is an idea advanced by the maverick economist Hyman Minsky seems to have much more currency beyond the ivory tower than within it. But at least a few economists are working on something more revolutionary. A new interpretation of recessions, booms, and financial markets that more closely matches the popular idea that business cycles are both predictable and driven by irrationality. The basics of this new idea are laid out in a presentation by Nicola Gen- um, Genaoli and Andrea Andrea Schleifer, 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 
two benefit behavioral financial specialists venturing into the realm of macroeconomics. Genioli and Schlieffer take their cue from a number of recent papers hitting that recessions are actually possible to predict years in advance if one simply pays attention to the right variables. One of these is the 2013 paper by Robin Greenwood and Samuel Hansen showing that when junk bond issuance increases and credit spreads narrow, a credit bust often tends to follow two or three years later. Another is a 2016 paper by Matthew Barron and Wei Xiang showing a similar result for bank lending instead of corporate bonds. A third recent paper by David Lopez Salido, Jeremy C. Stein, and Egon Zarajsek adds term spreads to Greenwood and Hansen's list of forecasts and find that together these indicators give a decent amount of warning about recessions two or three years down the road. Other papers find a correlation between rapid credit growth and heightened recession risk. All of these papers have one thing in common. They use debt to predict recessions years in advance. That fits with the the emerging post-crisis wisdom that problems in credit markets are the source of both financial uh, crashes and the ensuing economic slowdowns. Genioli and Schlieffer explain these patterns by turning to their own preferred theory of human irrationality, the theory of extra, extra, extrapolative expectations. Basically, this theory holds that when asset prices rise, home values, stocks, and so on, without a break, investors start to believe that this trend represents a new normal. They pile into the asset pumping up the price even more, and seeming to confirm the idea that the trend will never end. But when the extrapolator's money runs out, reality sets in and a crash ensues. Jenny Oli and Schlieffer and and their co-authors have been only one of of several teams of researchers to investigate this idea and its implications in recent years. I wonder how long their time spans are, and really what they're what they're uh, using as quantitative data. Uh, continuing on, when extrapolative expectations are combined with an inherently fragile financial system, a predictable cycle of booms and busts is the result. At some point during good economic times, irrational exuberance takes hold, pushing stock prices, house values, or both into the stratosphere. When they inevitably come down, banks collapse, taking the rest of the economy with them. This story, if it became the standard model of the business cycle, would represent a true revolution in macroeconomics. It disregards two pillars of recent macroeconomic thought, rational expectations and shock-driven, unpredictable recessions. It would represent a triumph for Minsky's ideas and for those outside the academy who have long urged macroeconomics to pay more... uh, macroeconomicists to pay more attention to debt markets and human psychology. And if the code of booms and busts can finally be cracked, there may be ways for central banks, regulators, or other policymakers to head off crises before they begin, instead of cleaning up afterward. So far, Genioli and Schlieffer's story isn't close to achieving dominance in macro, but all of the ideas being put forth in the field, this seems like the most interesting one to watch. Um, no, not, not terribly so. They're all based on debt. Debt is arbitrary. And, and when I say that, it, it comes down to who is the debt to. If the, if the um, creditor in question is waving a magic wand and creating money, 
you know, a few hundred billion at a time or whatever, um, what's it really worth? <laughs> you know? I And when I was talking about time spans, you know, the, the boom-bust cycle, <clears throat> it's always in an upward trajectory. If you uh, if you look at houses, all right, even even after the uh, the credit markets bust and then and nobody wants to give you loans to to buy a house or anything like that, even after all of that bullshit, when houses do come back down to some sort of reasonable level where people start buying them again, the price that they're selling at is always going to be higher than it was a decade beforehand. So this idea that it's, there's a boomer bust, no, 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 no. What's going on is that they get some sort of liquidity from borrowing, right? From from some entity. In in this case, probably the Federal Reserve or, or other such central bank. They extend the credit, right? And so they buy some sort of asset, and then they do it again, and they do it again, and they do it again, and they do that. As, as long as they're able to keep covering the payments on the loans, right? You know, so of course, they're probably going to start with some sort of actual asset to act as collateral for the beginning of this whole debt cycle. But then other people notice this activity going on. They're like, wait a minute, you know, there's less real estate than there was before and, you know, there, it's actually coming back online now as far as sales goes, but it's a bit higher than than it was a couple months ago. Hmm. Maybe I ought to buy it now. And so then in another two months, I could probably roll it over for, you know, a higher price. Because obviously it's, it's becoming more valuable. You know, as whoever this entity is sucks up more and more of it. It's, it's increasing the uh, demand for the remaining properties in the vicinity. And so that drives other people into it. They borrow money and and do the same thing themselves. And and then you get ten and twenty and thirty poor you know, get hundreds and thousands of people involved in this, and then you end up with one of your quote unquote booms. But eventually people start falling out of it. Either they, they want to sell out and and you know end up with one home and, and basically retire from the whole game you know and so they get a little bit greedy and they want a few hundred million instead of just 10 million and so when they cash out that takes that much more liquidity out of the system and the whole system feels that additional uh, tension on it but you know the this whole predictable cycle and whatnot. Yeah, they create a lot of exuberance. A lot of players get burned. Some players make a lot of money or a decent amount of money, but a very very tiny minority makes a shit ton of money. And they're usually the creditors that are at the base of the whole thing. So again, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, the stimulus from the the central bank or the the bubble that was that ensued thereafter, you know, could just be like, uh, like shark fishing, you know, you chum, chum up the shark, you throw out some bait, you catch some fish and you bail. But yeah, um, all of this theory and stuff, I, um, I find it really interesting because there are, metrics to be used now that uh, that'll give you some macroeconomic models that uh, that you never had access to before I mean demonstrations of uh, monetary activity over the Bitcoin network or any other cryptocurrency network when you when you're talking about a uh, an asset as opposed to an IOU or a debt vehicle as I like to call them um that I think that changes the behavior set of the person using it to uh, transact. I could be wrong on that, but that's that's been my experience that people treat Bitcoin a bit differently than they treat their uh, credit card. You know, they have to think in terms of 
okay, if I spend it right now, is am I going to be losing value? You know, is it going to be going up in the next week or so? In in to such an extent that I would be losing a significant sum of money by cashing it right now. You know, it's like it's a little bit of a. I mean, I'm sure that people that have been trading trading stocks and whatnot have experienced that same sensation, but that has been a lot more more ephemeral for you know for people like myself who did not have access to legacy markets to the level that I have with cryptocurrency markets. You know, it's a it's a bit different experience than you know calling up my broker and saying, hey. I want you to buy some Apple stock because I think it's going to go rocket sauce. And then him say, oh, well, you know, mostly I deal with blue chips. I, I don't really get into that tech stuff. I'm like, dude, are you fucking kidding me? It's $4 and change right now. Buy the shit. And so I did. <laughs> I, I sold it before it went completely fucking rocket sauce. But, it, you know, if you go back to when I bought it, and you, and you look to where it is now, it's one of the most valuable tech companies in the entire planet, you know, and everybody was laughing at me at the time, you know. <sighs> Hindsight is always twenty twenty, but I did get some important lessons out of that one. I really did, and uh, it's, it's given me a little bit of discipline on some stuff that... You know, only that kind of experience can give you. <laughs> you know, you got to get wrecked to figure out why you don't do certain things. And, you know, yeah. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. And uh, I hadn't had anything picked out. But I haven't played any Nothing Face in a long time. So, it's got to be Nothing Face. Um, can't wait for violence. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Crowbar with New Man Born. <laughs> you know, I, I love my Twitter feed. I love crypto Twitter. I just, I, I love it to no end because I, I see the, the funniest shit that mostly the only people that would really understand it are people that are involved in crypto. Um, but I caught this one and I, I, I think I should do a PSA by propagating it here on the show. And uh, this is by Bella, uh, at Bitcoin Bella underscore. Too embarrassed to confess to my business partner that I blew up the work Chromebook last year trying to mine folding coin. Hoping he will see this message and we can just forget this ever happened. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking, I'm going to give it a retweet too. Fucking crypto life, motherfucking crypto life. That's that's pretty much the long and short of it, you know? What the fuck? You gotta do it. Gotta do it! Anyway, I got a ton of stuff that I did, uh... I did pursue while, uh... While we were having our last music break. Kind of trying to utilize that time wisely. And, uh... This one I found really entertaining. Um, because the answer to it is just don't tell the Washington Utility Board that you intend to mine. Just do it. Anyway, continuing on, this is on Cointelegraph.com by Anna Alexander. So no, no penis. 31 minutes ago. Washington Utility stops accepting applications for crypto mining. Don't ask, just fucking do it. A customer-owned utilities company in rural Washington has stopped it, stopped accepting applications for electricity from crypto mining and similar blockchain operations, the Seattle Times reported July 30th. The Franklin Public Utility District Commissioners, PUD, have approved a moratorium that will allow time for staff to investigate the impact of cryptocurrency mining on the electrical system before accepting applications. The PUD staff will also consider the new rate structure, or a new rate structure. 
While initially drawn to rural Washington and New York by cheap electricity, miners are increasingly falling under the scrutiny of local regulators and power utilities who are concerned about long-term power supply for residents and other businesses. What's the fucking concern, man? You're going to be making more money. In April, another rural Washington public utility, Chelan PUD, ordered staff to enforce a moratorium on crypto mining with the discovery of unauthorized mining activities becoming concerned with the state and safety of electricity systems. The enforcement measures included fines and penalties, disconnecting service, reporting unauthorized loads to law enforcement as power theft, and firing officials to protect public safety. Give me a fucking break. Earlier this month, New York State regulators approved a new electricity rate scheme for cryptocurrency miners that will allow them to negotiate contracts. The decision gives 36 municipal power authorities permission to charge crypto miners more than other consumers. Oh, great. You're, you're going to fucking discriminate against miners. Fuck you. The Messina municipal, municipal Utility will consider contracts and set prices on a case-by-case -case basis, meaning if there are friends, we'll let them do it, but if it's you, fuck you. For crypto miners who are interested in conducting operations there, which reportedly will protect other utility customers from increased rates. Yeah, so their kids are going to get to mine, but not you. Fuck you. Some local authorities have been more welcoming of crypto mining operations. In April, Port of Walla Walla, Washington con commissioners unanimously agreed on a land lease and purchase option for 10 acres to be used for a cryptocurrency mining project by Bitmain subsidiary Ant Creek LLC. While the main concern of opponents to the project is the massive amount of electricity that the company will consume, the project meets the port's mission of job and tax base creation. <clears throat> yeah, so basically this is like a power shakedown. And my answer to it is quite simple. You go somewhere where you can create the capacity for generating your own electricity very, very cheaply. So, Arizona. Fucking dry, arid, sunny most of the year. Nevada. Good portion of it. Sunny. Open. Doesn't rain very much. You know, there, there's places all over the United States where there's a lot of land where you can, like, set up a solar setup or, you know, a wide variety of renewables that, that would offset your electricity demand, and these people never even know you're there. You know, after a while, they'll probably be coming to you for electricity because you'll probably be producing it cheaper than their, their local PUD. I, I think that the disruption of power structures that have surrounded electricity monopolies is starting. There is some some think they have the the option to say no. You, you, you don't. For every time you say no, somebody else says yes. Or somebody else just doesn't give a fuck. And their apathy would be just enough for some for it to take root somewhere else for the economic activity that it generates to happen somewhere else for the wealth the mining generates to happen somewhere else the, this isn't something where you can just point at it and say oh you can't do that here number one people aren't going to listen to you if they're interested they're just going to do it and not tell you about it same thing about pot you know, the, that's that's still, as far as I'm concerned, that whole market is still goofy as fuck. Because there are existing power structures and there's existing political interests and they have their interests. And they want to keep things in, in their interests. And that, you know, that's, that's nature. That's human nature. But 
the thing is is that the tent is getting bigger the capabilities that we have now to transact money and products all over the fucking place is growing by the day you can only live in the shadow of that capability for so long before people are pointing at it and saying hey why don't we use this to do this you know, and a lot of people that maybe some people that you don't have direct control over, or not as much control over them as you would need in order to to prohibit them from doing it, or inhibit them from doing it. <clears throat> and I, I think that that window of capability, like I said, it's growing by the day, and so the idea that you can. You can look at this widening chasm in front of you and say, No, you can't do that here. It's going to get around you. It's going to find a way around you. It's going to happen somewhere else. And then it will happen where you are too. Because everybody around you is going to be looking at it and going, Well, fuck, dude. Everybody around us is making a shit ton of money. We've got these stupid fucking policies and it's the only thing that's stopping us from making money too. So... Let's go ahead and scrap this shit and just like let it happen here too so we can make money too. I mean really dude, that's that's the kind of shift in thinking that we're talking about here. I mean, the the sources of money because they're not just little little groups here and there that they're available globally that opens up such such a oh, yeah. I, I can't I have a hard time quantifying it because it's so drastically different from what we currently have right now and again a lot of these articles that we read on here they give one the impression that the the rules have all been set for you and see the way I see things in cryptocurrencies is this is if you were the author of a cryptocurrency or a dev for a cryptocurrency and you deploy it out there you're as responsible as the expectations as you you set you know so for like dogecoin they're like dude don't take it seriously but the the fucking network works there are people mining the coin here we go i mean you set the expectation if you can meet the expectation and you meeting your expectation is better than other options available people will migrate to your product you know this idea that oh we're going to be the blockchain of this and we're going to be the token of that no 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 you're not you're not you think you are all your presentation materials say you will be but what will be is how the market uses your product if the market doesn't use your product you're nothing if the market uses your product in ways that you hadn't anticipated, well, pff, what are you then? Are you are you what they're using you for, or are you what you think you are? You know, it's like the dark web. You know, sure, it could be used to transact drugs and guns and all that other bullshit, right? But it it can also be used for legitimate regular retail transactions and it, as if there's really a discernment between the two i'm just saying that you know you could be buying other things or selling other things you know selling your art selling your music selling your products you know whatever it is you know i've been telling the bankers to take up macrame because that's about how useful they're going to be in the future is they are going to be making beautiful macrame but they're not going to be sitting at the desk because they're going to get replaced by a fucking AI with a blockchain and whatever either that or a 14 year old kid in Uzbekistan who just fired up his own variant of dogecoin you know the the pitbull coin or some shit like that and it becomes a, an international success and people start transacting it and it because <laughs> it gives them some sense of community or I, I don't know but money is a social phenomenon and sharing value is I don't know intrinsic to our nature I think anyway uh, I got this article here on CCN.com and uh, 
th th this is one of those little uh, splashes of cold water in the face. And uh, I think it's kind of funny given who, who it is saying it. And uh, so here it is. This is Ethereum News, July 31st. So it's from the future. Uh, 2018 to 20. Doesn't indicate AM or PM or even time zone. So yeah, take it for what it's worth. Ethereum creator. Mass adoption matters more than cryptocurrency ETFs. Ethereum co-founder Butalik Buterin, oh, I'm sorry, Butalik Buterin believes that the crypto community has focused too much on ETFs rather than making cryptocurrency easier to use as a method of payment for everyday purchases via payment cards, according to a recent tweet. An ETF will benefit cryptocurrency prices, he believes, but making it easier for people to use it will do more for mass adoption. Actually, ETFs won't do anything for the price. It'll give somebody people, it'll give some segments of the investor community a different vehicle that doesn't benefit the crypto community at all, as far as being able to benefit off of the fluctuations in price. Anyway, continuing on. Uh, this is a tweet by Vitalik. I think there's too much emphasis on BTCE slash ETH slash whatever ETFs and not enough emphasis on making it easier for people to buy 5 to $100 in cryptocurrency via cards or at corner stores. The former is better for pumping price, but the latter is much better for actual adoption. Predictably, the comment drew a lot of response on Twitter. One, tweet, one tweeter noted that creating the ability to earn cryptocurrency will do more to encourage adoption since when a person earns cryptocurrency, there is no need to convert it to fiat, which presents an inconvenience. Yeah, definitely a friction point where you can stuff AML KYC bullshit. Another tweeter noted that attempts were made in the past to make cryptocurrency usable for retail transactions, but regulatory concerns stopped businesses from issuing cards. The tweeter noted that such an effort might prove more successful at the present time. Others claimed there is no advantage to using crypto for retail transactions. And, and they're full of shit too. ETFs and mass adoption related. No, they're not. <clears throat> Continuing. While Buterin views ease of use for everyday transactions as key to mass adoption, the availability of cryptocurrency ETFs could also play a role in bringing that to pass. No, they can't. When the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission recently clarified that Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities, Many crypto advocates welcome the news since it bodes well for cryptocurrency ETFs. However, the decision also bodes well for the industry in ways that can impact mass adoption. Some view the SEC clarification as validating Coinbase's recent move to support the ERC-20 token standard. Dan Romero, Coinbase General Manager and Vice President, said last month at the current phase of cryptocurrency regulation, it is important for the company to integrate digital assets that cannot be categorized as securities. Coinbase May acquisition of Paradex, a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange, and Toshi Coinbase's native Ethereum app and integrating more tokens will encourage mainstream adoption of tokens, many believe. Circle co-founder and CEO Jeremy Allaire recently said one of the things that catalyzed the crypto market last year was that developers by the hundreds of thousands began building dApps to expand blockchain adoption. Eh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. I, I think it was more that people were starting to experience a lot of slippage in Venezuela and China and elsewhere in their national currencies and said, I need somewhere to stuff for my monetary value where I get to keep more of it from one hour to the fucking next. And this whole BT, uh, ETF bullshit, uh, I don't really see any, any real value. 
I, I'm sure somebody does. I'm sure some institutional investor is saying, I won't put a single dime in cryptocurrencies unless it's in the form of an ETF. And for that person, I would say, you are just as likely to lose your money on an ETF either by betting the wrong way or some sort of issue with regard to the exchange or the tokens that you're trading or the the products that you're trading in. Um, usually solvency concerns, you know, they go through an audit and they find you find out that they're over leveraged on their on their uh, reserves. You know, that they only have like 0.15 instead of 15% of reserves that they're supposed to have. These things happen. We've seen it before. To think that they won't happen in crypto is pretty silly, especially considering that crypto is the product of people actually doing work. <laughs> And again, they treat that a little bit differently than uh, when they've gone to a creditor, held out their hand and said, hey, I need $20 million. You know, we're, we're going to see some, some flash in the pan with regard to uh, ICOs, but it doesn't have any sustain to it, you know? It's all gaslighting. I don't know. I think that some will survive, but that we aren't going to have them a bit of a crash with regard to them I don't know I could be wrong I hope I am really I do for all the for all the naysaying and doom saying that I that I do on this show I really got to tell you I hope nothing but the best for the cur the projects that are in this space I I really do but the the likelihood of success is not just determined by ads and whatnot. It's it's determined by what you do. You know what I mean? Anyway, I got this article here on CCN.com. And as far as actions are concerned, uh, and, and this is authored on July 30th, 2018, 2235, no indication of time zone. Crypto mining firm CEO exit scams with $35 million in investor funds. The CEO of Sky Mining, a crypto mining company in Vietnam, has disappeared with investor funds totaling about $35 million, according to a local news outlet. About 20 investors of Sky Mining reported, reported the matter to the local police in the Phun Yan district after learning that, the, that approximately 600 mining machines had been removed by imposters who had claimed to be maintenance workers. The investors were also alarmed when they noticed the company's central office was shut down and its branding removed. The investors believed the company's CEO, Lee Min, Ta Lee Min Tam, who had been unreachable for a week, had run off with these stolen funds. Lee Min Hu Deputy Chairman of Sky Mining shared the same sentiment. In an interview with the local media, he said it was possible Tam stole the mining rigs along with the funds. While maintaining his innocence in the fraud, he said, quote, The board has reported this to the police and showed evidence that we are not guilty, he said. Quote, we are victims too. In a twist of events, Tam, who had not been in contact with any of his colleagues since the incident was reported, posted a 44-second video on Telegram where he claimed to be receiving medical treatment and promised to return investors' funds. Quote, You will have your money. Thank you for your cooperation. I did not run or go anywhere. I will come back soon, he said. The Sky Mining App Store claims to have more than 1,000 machines operating around the clock, allowing investors to rent mining rigs to earn passive income over a period. The company hosted events in Hanoi and H HCMC to attract investors in which its official cl officials claimed it was the biggest cryptocurrency mining company in Vietnam. 
Investors were advised to invest a minimum of $100 to $5,000 in each of the rigs, which were kept at a storage center owned by Sky Mining. The company also promised investors a mouthwatering return on investment plus commissions for inviting new members. Cryptocurrency mining has been on the rise in Vietnam as businesses lure investors with an attractive monthly interest in addition to capital invested. According to Xinhua, Por- Xin- Xinhua Report, Vietnam imported over 6,300 mining devices from January to April in 2018 and over 9,300 in 2017. Last month, Vietnam's central bank agreed to enforce stricter regulations on digital currencies by suspending the importation of crypto mining devices. (laughs) If it seems too good to be true, says Chris in the comments section, and we're definitely going to give him an upvote for that because that's the truth right there. Yeah, overpromising. It's a big problem in cryptocurrencies. You know, if you if you can't actually fulfill on the promises that you're making, you're no good to anybody. But uh, yeah, as far as um, the cryptocurrency mining firm CEO exit scamming, uh, I I suppose that remains to be seen. Uh, supposedly, according to this article, he's undergoing some sort of medical treatment. So, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe he got his knees capped or something like that. Anyway, I, I got this other article here. and th- I, I wanted to get a little international on this one. Um, this is author on um, CCN.com. It's authored July 31st, 2018 at apparently 12 a.m., 12.25 a.m. Iran's Bitcoin volume soars as real value enters, quote, death spiral. Iran's national currency has crashed to its low record against the U.S. dollar as the country prepares to face economic sanctions imposed by the Trump administration. The Iranian real, which was beginning to gain momentum after years of depreciation, set a new low on Monday, trading on an average at 100,000 rials on the black market. Oh, wow. Many Iranians are now agitated that their economy will collapse. The sentiment has furthered because of Iranian authorities' decision to impose restrictions on foreign currency transactions. The authorities have also started to crack down on those attempting to circumvent restrictions by purchasing gold coins in the black market. Stuck between a depreciating national currency and a, and strict law enforcement agencies, some Iranians are reportedly turning to Bitcoin and similar decentralized assets to elude sanctions. Since about May 2018, when U.S. announced its sanctions against Tehran, Bitcoin trading volume within the country has experienced a market uptick though it is still far below the all-time high it was it set last December. Around the same time, local media had claimed that Iranians had sent over $2.5 billion out of their land to purchase Bitcoin and other digital currencies. One Iranian, who wished to remain anonymous, confirmed that she has been purchasing some bitcoins every month out of her salary as a proactive measure against U.S. US sanctions. Smart. Very, very smart. Quote, I started purchasing bitcoin and even ethereum, thinking the Iranian central bank will not be able to resolve the poor economic situation, she told CCN. Quote, I had read many reports about Chinese and Venezuelan people during this during the same time of their economic crisis. She's also confirmed that real price dropped heavily against Bitcoin in the underground market, stating she was asked the equivalent of as much as $20,000 to purchase one Bitcoin by the same dealer who was selling it for $10,000 only last month. 
In international markets, the Bitcoin price against USD is around 81.30 at press time. National cryptocurrency a solution. They, f- dude, they fiddled around with this idea so much. Iran, despite banning Bitcoin and similar digital currencies in April this year, had announced that it will launch its own national cryptocurrency. Just very recently, the Iranian government confirmed that they have created a national encryption key, which would employ blockchain technology. Nevertheless, U.S. believes that efforts to bypass their sanctions will be in vain, for for they apply to people and organizations, not assets. The Trump administration had made, has made clear that those who would form business ties with Iran would be enmeshed by sanctions. A similar attempt made by Venezuela by launching an oil and mineral reserve backed cryptocurrency, the Petro, has not gone too well. It has dropped from its initial sale price of $60 to the current price of $16.50, with minimal demand from global markets. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, wait. We got some comments here. Check this out. Too Many Lies, two hours ago, says, You can be certain, servant, that after the U.S. sanctioned Russia and China, they will sanction Bitcoin, possibly even before Russia and China. When, when was any greedy bastard ever satisfied and said, quote, I have enough. The U.S. Treasury will one day... Take a stand against Bitcoin, and it will become worthless. Yeah, you're full of shit. And uh, Servant Nine, just imagine how much Bitcoin will go up when the U.S. dollar starts crashing. Yeah, absolutely, dude. That's what you're watching. That's what you're fucking watching. Since since it was worth what you know, point one cent until today, it the U.S. dollar has been losing value against Bitcoin. It's currently at eighty eighty one hundred and thirty dollars per Bitcoin. I mean, that's that's not an accident. That's in in my mind anyway. That's a function of economics, global economics, on a digital asset. Um, as for uh, <clears throat> the U.S. sanctioning Bitcoin. Or China sanctioning Bitcoin, or Iran even sanctioning Bitcoin, uh, it's all irrelevant. The nations can, uh, the na- national government can say whatever they want. It's it's a matter of being able to actually execute, again, produce, and they may be able to some extent, you know, maybe limit mining or something. But that don't just mean that it's happening somewhere else, and somebody else is getting rich off of it. You know, I, I had this same same discussion in a, um, a city a city council meeting. Uh, they were talking about putting moratoriums on recreational dispensaries in this area. And I was like, you know, if you do that, the money's just going to go across the river o- over to Eugene, and, and they're not going to have any compunction about about it. They're just going to go ahead and put in their retail outlets. And all the money, that, all of the economic activity that would have been happening here would be happening there. And, it, it, you know, the, that's, that's not really that smart, you know? I mean, why, why would you limit yourself? I know the, the urge is that you're trying to limit others, but if you do try and limit them they're just going to circumvent your ass because they're just as powerful as you are on this stuff it's a it's a lesson we're finding out again and again and again in crypto you know where Iran they've talked about doing this this uh, cryptocurrency now for uh, I want to say about two maybe three years now they've been kicking around this idea and I, I mean I'm sure they've got some sort of working product but the question is this, is anybody going to use it? What will the demand be for it? If somebody can use a cryptocurrency that isn't part of part of your your government program, why are they going to use your cryptocurrency? Is it going to be because you're going to hold a gun to their head and tell them not to use other cryptocurrencies? 
that's not working out with U.S. dollars. So what do you think? It, uh, what do you think the effect's going to be when when we're talking about digital currencies that don't have a physical corporeal existence? I mean, I, I think it's kind of like game over. You know, <laughs> hasn't really even begun yet. Hasn't really needed to begin much further than it's al it already is gone. And the game is pretty much over. You know, I mean, we've been watching this posturing. It's like Russia says something, and then they forget about it. And then China says something, and they forget about it. And India says something, and then they forget about it. And then Venezuela says something, and they forget about it. And Iran says something, and they forget about it. Yeah, come on, man. You know, I, I know that there are some little bits of legislation, some frameworks that are popping up here and there. But again, the question is, how effective will they be? And with the capabilities of cryptocurrencies, when it does, when and if it does ever come to push and shove, which I don't really think it will be, it'll be, I, I think it'll be more of a, a whimper than a bang, honestly. But whenever that does happen, <laughs> uh, you know, it'll just happen. It's it's not a it's not an if. It's a when. You know, where people will decide that they would rather transact in currencies that, that you don't track and don't produce. And, and then all the effort that you put towards trying to make them do that will basically be a net loss. Because you will not have created the adoption that you've been trying to create. I mean, <laughs> choice is such a big component of cryptocurrencies having the option to decide where you want to store your monetary value is key you know and like I said earlier money is a social phenomenon it's a means of communication and that being said people are going to talk to one another how they want to talk to one another regardless of what anybody else wants Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music for just a, a brief moment. But I'm kind of, I'm kind of winding down. I'll tell you what—they really took it out of me in jujitsu today. Kind of strangled it out of me. And uh, as far as that goes, let's go ahead and throw down a little bit of "Within the Ruins," beautiful agony here on Coin Metal. And that was Slipknot with Left Behind. And it is with that we're drawing this one to a close. And as far as what I can say about, uh, about what we have read today, uh, there's a big difference between what governments say, what, what crypto publications say, and what's possible for you to do. And of course, it is up to you to determine exactly uh, exactly how that shakes out. It's how you decide that you want to participate or not, of course. The option is yours! And uh, yeah, I don't think anything that um, a government or a publication can say about it is going to change that fact, really. Um... You know, as we've seen in in that one article from Iran, the the restrictions that are being placed on both U.S. dollars and Bitcoin it, within their borders has just caused a premium. You know, now it's worth about ten thousand U.S. dollars for one Bitcoin, or actually that that article said twenty thousand dollars for for a uh, a Bitcoin. Word. Where it had previously, as in like the previous week, only been ten thousand dollars a bitcoin. So I mean, what's that really telling you? It tells me that this shit is not going to stop. And every time that there is some sort of government calamity or whatnot, that people are simply going to use cryptocurrencies to circumvent them. And it won't matter what a government says about it. People are going to do what they're going to do. And I tell you what, it's a lot easier to hide, you know, say $10 million in Bitcoin than it is to hide $10 million worth of, worth of gold or silver. 
but such is the age and the era that we live. And uh, with that being said, we are going to go ahead and close it out. We will be back again on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I want you all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. Thank you very, very much for listening. I, I'll do my best to get this episode up on the YouTube channel as quickly as humanly possible. So until Wednesday, you'll have an excellent evening. Last dance for the evening is Sepultura Arise here on Coin Metal. Thanks again for listening, and you all have an excellent evening. <laughs>